Welcome back strangers, Janet Airlines is the unofficial name given to the highly classified fleet of passenger aircraft operated for the United States Department of the Air Force as an employee shuttle to transport military and contractor employees. The airline mainly serves the Nevada National Security Site, which includes Area 51, but the airline is known to go to at least 15 different destinations, including Salt Lake City, the Naval Air Weapons Station, China Lake, Edwards Air Force Base, and Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Janet Airlines operates a private terminal at the Las Vegas McCarran International Airport. At the west side of the airport, you'll find a small parking lot and terminal for the Seeker Airline. It is operated by the defense contractor ACOM, and all pilots, airline stewards, and terminal workers have to undergo a single scope background investigation in order to obtain a top secret security clearance. The airline operates a small fleet of Beechcraft aircraft and at least six different Boeing 737s that are all painted white with a red stripe along the entire fuselage. You can see them take off and land daily in Las Vegas, which is only a short 25 minute flight from Groom Lake, Nevada, the site of Area 51. Strangers, would you work for Janet Airlines if you had the chance? Let us know in the comments below. Area 51 is officially called the Homey Airport or Groom Lake after the salt flat next to the airfield. It was originally used as a military base during World War II. The remote location was used to build prototypes of the U-2 planes and run test flights of the top secret aircraft. The U.S. Air Force officially took over control of the site in 1955 and has used it to test other aircraft like the Oxcart and F-117 Nighthawk. The American people had no idea what the government was doing at the site, and it quickly became the central component of many conspiracy theories involving aliens, UFOs, and secret military weapons. The base has never been formally declared a top secret site, but the intense secrecy surrounding the site has made many question what the true purpose of the base is. The government didn't publicly acknowledge the existence of the facility until June of 2013. They acknowledge that the base was used as an open training range that supports the development and testing of experimental aircraft and weapons. Until 2018, you couldn't view satellite images of Area 51, but now you can. Most have accepted that the strange lights and aircraft witnessed flying nearby the site were all man-made, top-secret aircraft. Yet, that hasn't stopped many from believing the facility is used to develop new aircraft, weapons, and technology using reverse-engineered alien technology. Many believe that this technology has either been given to the government by extraterrestrials or was developed from debris found at crashed UFO sites that was discovered and covered up. What do you think the government is hiding at Area 51? Do you think the leap in technology that has occurred in the past 100 years is pure human ingenuity? Or have we been receiving help from advanced extraterrestrial species? From 1896 to 1897, there were numerous sightings of a mysterious cigar-shaped airship that was witnessed all across the United States. On April 17, 1897, in Aurora, Texas, an unknown airship crashed into a windmill, causing it to explode into thousands of tiny pieces, leaving the pilot so badly disfigured that he couldn't be recognized. It all happened on the property of the local judge, J.S. Proctor. The incident was reported in the Dallas Morning Newspaper on April 19, 1897. The pilot was reported to be not of this world, and was even referred to as the Martian, according to a report from an army officer from the nearby Fort Worth. The supposed alien pilot did not survive the crash and was buried with full Christian rites at the local nearby Aurora Cemetery. Part of the crash wreckage was dumped in a nearby well near the windmill crash site and some of it was buried in the alien grave. The graveyard would never grant permission to have the corpse exhumed for testing, and the exact location of the burial site is no longer marked after the gravestone was stolen in the 1970s when the local legend became national news. A 1986 movie called The Aurora Encounter recreates the famous incident. In 1935, Judge Proctor's property was purchased by Brawley Oaks, and he moved the debris from the well in order to use the water source on the property. Later he developed an extreme case of arthritis, which he claimed to be the result of drinking the contaminated water from the wreckage dumped in the well. Brawley sealed off the well and placed a concrete slab in an outbuilding over top, so no one would accidentally drink the water ever again. So now the well water can't be examined and tested today. 
The most likely explanation for what happened was a couple of drunks wanted to cover up the fact they accidentally burned down a windmill that was located on the town judge's land. Another theory is that the paper invented the whole story to create publicity to save the dying town. Over the past few years, Aurora, Texas had suffered several disasters that had decimated the tiny town's population. The incident is strikingly similar to Roswell. It involved a UFO crash, an alleged alien body was recovered, and the whole thing was reported in the local papers. Do you think an alien crash landed in Aurora, Texas in 1897, or was the whole thing a hoax? I've always been interested in space and whether or not we are alone in the universe. It started with a book I found in my elementary school's library about UFOs and possible alien encounters. Many stories are easy to debunk with false memories, military aircraft, mistaken meteors, satellites, or even swamp gas. However, sometimes there are UFO cases so strange they leave you wondering what did the person actually witness. Today we are going to discuss the Falcon Lake Incident one of the most well-documented UFO cases in Canada. On May 20th, 1967, Stephen McCulloch was searching for quartz and silver along Falcon Lake. He was an industrial mechanic by trade and an amateur geologist. He was familiar with the area and had some success finding minerals there a year earlier. That morning, he had gotten up early and was near a vein of quartz when he was startled by a gaggle of cackling geese. When he looked up to see what had frightened the geese, he saw two glowing red oval-shaped objects hovering in the sky 150 feet away from him. He watched as one of the objects descended and landed on a flat section of rock in front of him. The other object remained in the sky, but the color of it changed from a glowing red to gray. It also appeared more dislike. however it suddenly began moving west and disappeared into the woods. The object that had landed also changed to the same grayish color. It looked like it was made from an incandescent, stainless steel. Steven stared at the strange craft. He believed he was witnessing a top-secret United States military aircraft. He slowly approached it to get a closer look. It was 40 feet wide and 15 feet tall. It looked like a bowl with a dome on top. There was a whirling sound coming from the craft that almost sounded like it was caused by a motor, along with a strong stench in the air that smelled like sulfur. As he got closer, the whirling motor side died down to a low hum, which allowed Stephen to hear voices coming from inside the craft. He heard two distinct voices that sounded like high-pitched humans, but their voices were muffled so he couldn't hear what they were saying. There appeared to be a door on the side of the craft that was emitting bright lights. He put on his welding goggles so he could safely look inside. There he saw a maze of lights and panels flashing different colors. He didn't see anyone inside, but he could still hear the strange voices coming from somewhere inside the craft. Stephen thought they might need help, so he called out to them. The voices got quiet, but there was no response to his questions. So he called out again in his native Polish, then German, and finally Russian, not knowing what language the pilots might speak. He heard no response from the voices, and the craft was radiating so much heat that it was impossible for him to climb in through the door. Suddenly, three panels slid across the opening in the door and sealed the craft from the outside. It began rotating counterclockwise as it prepared to take off. It appeared like part of the craft was made from a layer of colorful glass. Steven tried to reach out and touch it, but it was so hot that it melted the glove he was wearing. He pulled his hand back and watched the craft rotate around. Before he could move away, he saw a panel full of holes on the side. When the craft took off into the sky, Stephen was hit in the chest by hot gas that was expelled from the holes in the panel. He was knocked to the ground and his shirt was burned across his chest and stomach. All he could do was lie on the ground and watch this mysterious object disappear into the sky. He was left disoriented and nauseous. His whole chest burned and he couldn't stop smelling that same sulfur smell that came from the craft. He slowly got up and stumbled and made his way back to his truck. He left his equipment at the lake and drove to his hotel room before going to the hospital. He was treated for burns to his chest and stomach that had turned into raised sores and formed a grid-like pattern across his body. He told the hospital he was burned by exhaust from an airplane. For months after the incident, he suffered from headaches, blackouts, diarrhea, and weight loss. A month later, Stephen finally came forward to the public with what actually happened to him. He was examined by a Mayo Clinic 
psychologist, which found that he wasn't suffering from significant emotional distress or mental illness. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police investigated the incident and had Stephen take them to the exact site where it occurred. They confirmed that he had consumed a large amount of beer the night before. However, they also took samples of the soil and rock from the area, which were found to contain large amounts of radiation. Today, the Department of National Defense in Canada identifies the case as unsolved. They concluded the area did contain an unnaturally high level of radiation, but it wasn't significant enough to endanger humans. Many skeptics believe the whole story was a hoax to cover up the fact that Stephen injured himself drunk in the woods. Skeptics also point out the fact they had a financial interest to make up the story to scare away other potential prospectors that would be interested in searching the area for silver and quartz. In April of this year, the Royal Canadian Mint issued a special edition $20 silver coin depicting the alleged encounter as part of Canada's Unexplained Phenomena series. What do you think, strangers? Did Stephen encounter two unidentified flying objects in the woods that left him burned and disoriented? Or did he make the whole story up to cover up a drunken accident and to protect the area from others looking for precious metals? If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to leave us a like and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. It really helps us out. Smash that bell button so you never miss out on the strangest video. And as always, stay strange.